My name is Elizabeth Larson and I'll be your moderator. We're uh, glad tonight to welcome our three candidates for this year's race and in alphabetical order, Don Anderson, Shonda Harry, and Andre Ross. So thank you all for being here. And this has been a very busy campaign season for all three of them. We're, uh, we're glad that we were able to get them all in for an evening. And thank you to all of you uh, who are here tonight as well. So tonight's event is we want to recognize our co-sponsors, Lake County Economic Development Corporation and the Lake County Bar Association are joining with Lake County News um, in uh, hosting tonight's event. They've also hosted the two previous forums we've done this season and we have two more coming up. And I want to give a, a very special shout out to Mary Modio of the Bar Association. Had it not been for or her organization and logistical prowess, we probably wouldn't be here tonight. So thank you. Thank you, Mary, for, for pulling this all together. She is a champ. Um, so, we are going to get uh, right into it because we have a lot of great questions and we will be taking some from the audience. Again, if you if you have a question, don't uh, hesitate to flag down Jeff Lucas and he will come and bring you a card or pick up your question. So let's move right into the opening statements. We're just going to give them a chance to introduce themselves before we move into the question and answer session. Later we'll also have a closing uh, a statement opportunity for them. And we're going to go in alphabetical order as far as the openings. So we will be starting with uh, Don Anderson. You have one minute. Good evening. Thank you, Elizabeth and John, for putting on this event along with the Lake County Bar Association. Um, one minute's not long to try to sell yourself to a group. So uh, hopefully there will be a lot of questions and, and answers that will you'll be able to judge people on. Uh, just very briefly about me, I've lived in Lake County for 49 years. This is where I've lived, uh, my children live, my great-grandchildren, my grandchildren and my great-grandchildren. Uh, when it came to Lake County, in essence, I was in high school, graduated from there to working in the, the farms. Uh, then I became a deputy sheriff, worked there for 15 years, uh, went to law school, became a private attorney for 20 years, in the last eight years, uh, I've been the elected district attorney. And in this election, hopefully the voters are going to look at the experience, not only look at the experience of the candidates, but also what success they've had in their legal careers and using that experience. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thanks. Shanda? Good evening. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Uh, my name is Shanda Harry. I've been an attorney for 18 years. I went to law school at UCLA. My family's been in Lake County since the 1960s. My great-grandparents owned a resort over in Clear Lake over here in the 60s and 70s. And my family was based here, and about 15 years ago, um, my parents, my aunt and uncle, my grandmother decided to move up here, and I decided to come as well. I went to work for, after working at a law firm in Los Angeles, I went to work for Robinson Rancheria, and then I was an uh, ICWA attorney for Hoplin because my specialty is Indian law. And then I was at the DA's office as a deputy DA for four years, and now I've been with the county council for six years. So um, now I would like to become a judge, so thank you. Thank you. Andre. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for coming tonight. I know you all had uh, other things you uh, were thinking of doing, but you made the right decision. Uh, we are here tonight to discuss issues of great public importance. One of the three people sitting up here at this podium attempting to introduce themselves to you is going to be given the job of hearing evidence, making very important decisions that have very important impacts on your lives, or the lives of your family members, or your friends, or someone that you're in a civil dispute with. Uh, judicial elections are probably the most important transfer of public political power that hardly any people pay any attention to. Most folks do not understand what the job description of a judge requires. Most folks don't have any appreciation of what distinguishes a judge from the standard attorney. Uh, I've been living and working in Lake County by choice for the last 11 years. I joined Mike Ewing's law firm in January of 2007. Uh, I love Lake County. I want to make Lake County a better place. I want our future to have glory days ahead of us. I want Lake County to build something that we can be proud of in the short run, and that will bring your grandchildren back here to live and have families of their own in the long run. Thank you. I'll continue later. Okay. That, that minute goes fast. So, All right, we're going to move into the questions. 
And beforehand, we usually do a uh, coin toss. It's a little bit more challenging when you have three. So we made him Rochambeau it. And Andre won, and he elected to have Don go first. So we're just going to rotate through in, in that order. Thank you. OK. So we'll, we'll get started with the questions. More coming in. Thank you. So Don will go first. Again, two minutes each to answer each question. And the first question. The job of judge is arguably one of the hardest a person can take on. While those who hold the job or have held it say it is incredibly rewarding, it's also incredibly challenging. It involves long hours, missed time with family, mental exhaustion, heartbreaking cases, stressful situations, and incredibly large caseloads. Local judges have said that they can deal with up to 120 cases in a typical day. Why do you want this job? <laughs> I guess my mom never said I was all that smart, but it's a very rewarding judge, like the judges are saying, and Elizabeth has told you. Uh, and it makes a difference in, in your life to do something you've always wanted to do, and it's to do something good for the community. And that's really been my goal since I, I got out of high school. Um, I, I started at San Luis Junior College Campus Police helping people then uh, a deputy sheriff. I love being a deputy sheriff. You go out on your calls, you help people, at the same time enforcing laws. In a private practice, um, I probably put in a lot more hours than judges do uh, because you're working for a living. I think Judy Kennard can tell you that. You're constantly working. You take it home at night, it's part of you. And then when I got elected district attorney, it became worse. Uh, it's a 24-hour job being the DA. You're constantly, not only at work doing things, you're out in the community, you're talking to people, you're getting calls at three in the morning, say an officer involved in a shooting, or there's been this murder, or whatever, and you're getting up and going and trying to help uh, the, the law enforcement agency or take over an investigation. So, maybe what I'm trying to say is, if I become a judge, I know it's gonna be many, many hours a week, a day, and a month, it's going to be exhausting, and it's going to be, uh, how would you say, a relief to get the break from what I'm doing now. Because in all seriousness, I work on an average 60 hours a week now, and uh, more even at home. But I love it, and I will continue to do it. Thank you. Thank you. Sean? You know, I think the most important thing you can do, in a sense, to serve your community is find a job that fits your skill set. And I had sort of an epiphany about 16, 17 years ago when I was first in court that a judge fit my skill set, uh, being a judge fit my skill set. I never thought about it before. You, you don't really think about being a judge necessarily when you go to law school, but what is generally considered important is having a judicial temperament. And that is patience, intelligence, the ability to have, the ability to see both sides, and the ability to make decisions. And that is what I feel my strengths are. And so when I was looking at what would be the best way for me to continue my career in the best way, I love public service, and that's what I've done for the last 10 years, and I'd like to continue it. And I believe that being a judge would fulfill that. Um, as to the hard work, I'm no stranger to hard work. I, worked my way through college and law school, so it, it, is, it is just something I'm used to. So I think it is the, the next step in a, in a career evolution and where I want to go. Serving Lake County as a Superior Court judge is the only job more important than the job I already have serving my clients. Uh, I made the choice to come to a community away from the city and to build something for myself and my community, and I've done that with my work for my for Ewing and Associates and my service as a member of Lakeport Kiwanis Club. And there's only one job more important than that of an honest and truthful and ethical advocate, and that is the job of an honest, truthful, ethical, competent, efficient judge. I think Lake County's Citizens and voters and residents deserve that level of service. I think given my age, my education, 
my qualifications and my professional experience, I can do an exemplary job in that capacity. Um, uh, it's a very important position. It requires one to set aside their practice of law, uh, to withdraw from membership in the state bar, and you join a much smaller group of professionals, men and women, dedicated to upholding the law and doing so in a way that is fiercely independent of public opinion and public bias and public prejudice. And I can think of no way finer to serve one's community than to complete that job uh, in an honest, ethical manner and with integrity. Thank you. Next question, we'll start with Shonda. What do you believe are the characteristics that distinguish a very good Superior Court judge from a good Superior Court judge? And please tell us which characteristics you possess and provide supportive examples. So I think the difference between a good judge and a great judge is one that pays attention to the people that come into their courtroom. I believe that too much that goes into our courts is, is um, well, in, the, in Lake County, many people represent themselves. And I think that the capacity to listen to people, I feel like I'm yelling in the side, the capacity to listen to people and to make decisions but do it with compassion and understand what's going on and apply that, the law to those facts is the most important thing. I think that um, I've had experiences in my current job where you really have to listen to find the reasons behind what's going on. And I think that is, is what makes a judge, or is a characteristic that I have that would make me a good judge. Because there's always the surface of what's going on and then there's always what's important in a legal capacity and I think it's very important to listen until you get to that point. Thank you. Andre. Quite easily, I could sum up what the qualities of an excellent ju judge as follows. Uh, a judge needs compassionate listening skills, needs to be able to pay attention to factual details, needs to be able to pay attention to legal details, needs to be able to withhold judgment until all of the evidence is presented, all of the objections have been raised, all of those objections have been ruled upon, and then reach a decision based upon admissible evidence in accordance with the law. It also helps to have a functional sense of humor uh, and compassion for folks who find themselves either in court without a lawyer or in court with a lawyer who may not be having the best day or exemplifying the best skills and, ca and characteristics of a competent counsel. All of this has to be done with a great measure of diplomacy and uh, utmost attention to upholding the law and protecting the integrity of the process. That makes an exceptional judge. Thank you. Don. There's a lot of factors which make a good judge. Uh, one has to be knowledge, you have to know the law, you have to know the, the rules of evidence, which is extremely important. Everybody hears about knowing the law, but you have to, as a judge, know how to rule on instantaneous, on different objections, admissibility of evidence. Uh, you have to have the ability to listen, and not only listen, but understand why people do what they do and in some cases show a lot of compassion, and in some cases don't show the compassion, depending upon the case. Experiences, it dates back, I think, from when I was a deputy sheriff. Um, I have a lot of horrible experiences, a lot of things I wish I could forget. A lot of things, uh, you see children die, you see children neglected. Those are experiences I have. Um, there have been times I've had to fight somebody, roll around the ground, and then the next day, you be able to shake hands and say everything's okay. Uh, I tried a murder case here several years ago of a four-year-old boy shooting up his family. That was a big experience in my life. Uh, one of the most gratifying things as a district attorney is I initiate the release of a gentleman by the name of Luther Jones, who 18 years ago was wrongfully convicted of child molestation. What was good about that, I, I sought the advice of the uh, Attorney General's office. They say turn it over the, the, uh, to the Attorney General's office and the Public Defender's office, and in a year you might make it out of jail. Well, I took the initiative, filed the writs, and within one week he was out of prison. Uh, on a daily basis, I talk to victims of crime. Uh, I feel their pain. Uh, 
you know, it all tolls on you, but that's part of life, and that builds me into what I am today. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, the next question will begin with Andre. How have you been preparing to be Lake County's newest judge? Have you spoken to current or former judges about the job's demands? Um, I made the decision to run for judge the day David Markham was installed on the bench. I saw a room full of people, the happiest room full of people I've seen in my 11 years in Lake County. Uh, a group of folks who were proud of uh, Judge Markham's accomplishments and who were genuinely committed to uh, looking at the positive aspects of life in Lake County. Uh, that means my decision to run for judge has really been in effect about six weeks or eight weeks. Notwithstanding, I have uh, a friend who was elected to the bench in Marin County last year. I spent uh, some, some time last year consulting with her about her election to judge. I understood what the job was about from her experience running, and when the opportunity came up here in Lake County, uh, it was an intriguing opportunity. Uh, the right people asked me to consider running for judge. This is not my first attempt to run for public office, and I learned a lot from my first attempt, which was unsuccessful. Um, I have spoken with uh, folks in uh, the judicial arena down in the Bay Area. Uh, I've left the local judges primarily alone because there are ethical limitations on whether or not current judges can endorse candidates. And uh, I have not had any conversations with any of the judges about that particular issue. Um, I've thought of the practical realities of running for judge on, on a short decision. It's a greater challenge, but the challenge is certainly worth it. And um, I don't think you have to dwell on it in, in order to make the run successful. Uh, and um, I'm, ho I'm looking forward to June 5th. I think the best result would be for this decision to be made for Lake County by Lake County on June 5th of 2018. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I wanted to run for judge many, many years ago on my early career as an attorney. Uh, I considered uh, putting my name in for the appointment uh, when Judge Markham was uh, appointed by the governor. And I, I thought about it long and hard, but when it came down to it, uh, that was two years into my second term. I made a commitment to the people of Lake County. I would be district attorney for four years. And I was going to keep that commitment. So that's why I did not put my name in. Then Judge Hestrom decided he was going to retire. And that was my opportunity. I have the most utmost respect and admiration for Judge Hestrom. So I would not run against him under any circumstances. Judge Hestrom, I go back to the days when he defended, uh, well, not defended, I'm sorry when he prosecuted the murders of Sergeant Richard Hellbush. We worked closely in that case. From that, that time on, I've had nothing but respect and admiration. And if anything else, he's been a mentor towards me. Uh, as far as speaking to the judges, I do not speak to them about the election. I don't think that's ethical. Although they do have the ability to endorse a candidate if they want. Uh, they, cannot, they can endorse judicial candidates, but they cannot endorse non-judicial candidates. But I haven't. But I do speak to judges on a weekly basis, or not a, almost sometimes on a daily basis. As the district attorney, we have a lot of administrative issues, a lot of legal issues that we, we talk about. Uh, some of it is with defense counsel, some of it is not. It's just my office and their offices dealing with each other. So I've, I've gotten to know them all, and I have a lot of respect and admiration for all the judges that are on the bench. Thank you. Shonda. So I'm going to give slightly a different answer. Um, Don Anderson is correct. Judges are allowed to endorse in only one case, and that is a judicial election. The idea is that they, um, they would be the best people to know whether someone would make a good judge. Um, they have declined to do so um, because they don't want to get involved in the election, but I have spoken to all the judges about whether they thought that I would make a good judicial candidate and I would not have gone forward with my plans, um, at least in this juncture, without getting advice from them. I thought that was very important. Also, um, 
I did apply for the position that David Markham got. Um, I went through the um, Judicial Nomination Evaluations Committee and was found qualified to be a judge. I, I always say he applied a few years before me, so um, he, he was next in line. But it was a very thorough uh, review of, I had to give names of people that I dealt with as opposing counsel in when I was a baby attorney 18 years ago. So I feel that I've been very well vetted to figure out whether I would make a good judge and I was found qualified and and I have got positive feedback from the judges. So I feel I feel comfortable that 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 I would make a good judge and, and other people feel so. Thank you. Next question we'll start with Dawn. Do you have a judicial role model? And I'm not it's not limited to just Lake County. It could be any judicial figure. And if so, please explain what that individual brings or brought to the role of judge and how that's impacted your view of the job. You know, like I just explained, I wish that this question was coming up, I wouldn't have gone to this detail in the last one. <laughs> Probably my biggest goal, judge, uh, role model was Judge Hester. Um, don't get me wrong, uh, Judge Hester has his uh, issues that we have to deal with. Uh, that. I'm not going to say hurt our office, but makes it difficult. And that's because he's very meticulous. He's very attentive. He makes us work. I remember doing trials against Judge Hesterman as a defense attorney. And we're there in, in, in court for eight hours. And you go home, you do about another eight hours worth of research. Um, but he seldom, if ever, makes a mistake. Um, I've, I've looked at his work ethics. He's there all the time. I can't think of a better judge that, to be a role model. As far as uh, federal and state judges, I'm not that close to them to be a role for them to be a role model to me. To be a role model, you, you have to know the person. And that's probably why I pick Judge Hestro. And I hope he doesn't listen to this because I'll hear about it if he does. <laughs> he might. So, just in case. All right, Sean. So rather than one role model as a judge, I tend to find the things I like in, every, in, in each individual judge that I can apply to what is important to me going forward. Um, I do agree that um, Judge Hedstrom is an incredibly hardworking judge, and he makes an incredible appellate record. I've had to do many appeals with just his record in front of me, and it is, it's incredible to be able to do it like that. Um, so I would say that he would be a role model in that regard. But to say who first made it so I wanted to be a judge, I'll shorten the story a little, but I had a situation when I practiced in Los Angeles where I took basically the same nine, I mean the same case in front of nine different judges. And I had, you know, the one that made everybody feel like they were an inch high, the one that was just sort of lazy and didn't do his job, and then I had this great judge in the middle who managed to um, not be easy on me because I was coming there for yet another continuance, but um, he, everybody liked him in his courtroom, not because he was easy, but because he respected everyone that came in, he treated them with respect, whether you were the defendant, the plaintiff, the court clerk, the bailiff, and he set the tone of the um, of his courtroom in an appropriate way. And so that is what I think is the most important thing that I learned, is that the judge sets the tone, it is their responsibility to make sure the court works and be respectful, and and respect is, is earned, it's not bestowed with a title. And the way you earn their respect is by respecting them in, in, in by respecting the people who come into your court. So if I had to pick a role model, it is this judge that nobody here would know, but who sort of changed the course of my life because it was that moment when I realized that, yes, I wanted to be a judge. Thank you. Andre. The question asks for a role model and a judge, and I learned long ago that one doesn't pick favorites amongst judges, one doesn't know when one's going to be in another judge's courtroom. I think all of our judges are exceptional judges and they were undoubtedly exceptional lawyers before they became exceptional judges. If there's a judge or justice out there that had an influence on the kind of lawyer I've become, I would have to say, 
I got to know Justice Thurgood Marshall the best during my time in law school, Brown the Board of Education, separate, but equal is not equal. Uh, and I have a good dose of William O. Douglas in my genetics, keeping the government off the people's backs. Uh, my many, many, many hours reading uh, the, the, the decisions and dissents of those justices formed the type of lawyer I started out uh, as and the type of lawyer I am today. Um, uh, I think Lake County has been blessed with a surplus of very hardworking judicial uh, officers, and I uh, hope that the next judge lives up to the standards already set by that team. Thank you. Next question, we'll start with Shonda. In the process of campaigning and meeting community members, what have you discovered to be the biggest misunderstanding that people have about being a judge, and how do you address that? I'd say the number one misunderstanding is what a judge actually is responsible for doing. Um, people ask me a lot of questions, you know, what's my opinion on gun control, whatever the hot hot topic of the day is. But the reality is, is judges don't take positions on these type of, of issues. Our job is to get a fact situation and apply the law. So I think that people are under the impression that um, a judge's opinions on things come in more than they should. I mean, I, I explain to people that Everybody has biases, and the first thing you have to do in um, dealing with your biases is acknowledging that you have them and making sure you set them aside in any decision that, that has to be made. But I think that is the biggest misconception that, that I have come about, is that, that judges rule from that position of a, whether it's a political bias or a personal bias on a particular issue, and a, and a good judge shouldn't simply. And so that is the thing that I have to explain, that I will make you a promise to be hardworking, I'll make you a promise that everyone will be treated fairly in my courtroom, but I can't you know, tell you how I'm going to rule on issue A, B, or C, because I can't tell you anything until you get a fact situation and I apply it to the law. Thank you. Andre. I've discovered uh, through my very scientific research in Lake County that everybody I've talked to has a pre-existing notion as to what a judge is. And that notion is influenced by Judge Ito, and Judge Wapner, and Judge Judy, and Judge Janine, and every other judge they've seen on television. And what I learned really quickly is that every learning opportunity is a teaching opportunity, and the best way to deal with that is uh, to uh, uh, take a step back, uh, show some patience, so show some grace, and offer a voter an opportunity to talk a little bit about who decides what happens in courtrooms and what the, what the, that person in particular interested. The best thing a candidate for judicial office can do is to try to encourage folks to wake up, open their eyes, go down and register to vote and educate themselves. And since I like to talk, uh, it's always an opportunity to do a little civics lesson at the, at the time when you're talking to a new voter. Thank you. Go on. I think the uh, biggest misconception I've heard from the public is that the uh, judges know everything. Uh, and despite the fact that they know everything, they still make some dumb mistakes. Kind of reminds me of a joke I heard a long time ago. What do you call a, an attorney with an IQ of 80? Call him Your Honor. Um, now I hope that's what's not listening now. But in any event, judges don't know everything. But like most judges, they take the time and the research to find out the answers to it. And they use their best discretion to make the decisions. And uh, even though the public thinks judges know it all and they're going to make wrong decisions, they try hard to make logical decisions, which normally they do. Thank you. Next question, we'll start with Andre. About a decade ago, state rules were changed about when judges can retire. The minimum age for retiring full benefits was raised from 60 to 70 years old. Are you prepared to serve an extended length of time in such a demanding job? Uh, yes, of course. Um, I estimate I've got another 15 years or so on my 
meter given that I'm 55 years old. Uh, a 70 year retirement age is, is uh, approximately two terms and that would be a reasonable, uh, a reasonable commitment to make with a possible third term if I uh, don't look forward to retiring. Um, this is an interesting election because we have three candidates, each with uh, uh, represented generational lawyers. Uh, Ms. Harry is, is younger than I, and Mr. Anderson is older than I. Um, I think it's an interesting choice. I, I don't see any trouble or problem making two terms for my uh, bench time, um, and uh, I actually don't see any problem with that at all because I'm a bit of a workaholic and uh, don't have any plans on retiring. Thank you. Don? Thank you, Andre. <laughs> Uh, I am older than Andre. <laughs> How much older? Shut up. <laughs> I, I, I'm 65 years old. By the time I take office, I would be 66. So I would be past the age of retirement for, before my first term was over. How long I would stay judge? You know, you can't tell. Uh, whether, you know, it depends depend on the mind and the body at the time my first term is over. Uh, I tell you right now, and I think in the near future, I'm not ready to be put out to pasture, even though I am an old man. But uh, that's it. I'll be around for a while. Thank you. Shonda? Well, I think the simple answer to that question is yes. Um, I have joked, well not joked, I actually mean it seriously, that the nice thing about having the possibility of having 20 years on the bench is that I would have enough time to learn how to do the job well, because I'm sure there's going to be a steep learning curve when you start any job. Um, so I see judges now that you know work well into their 70s. I went in front of a federal judge that was 87. So um, I intend to, this is an easy question for me, because the answer is yes. What I've got from some people is the concern that I'm too young, which is why I always point out that I've been an attorney for 18 years, and that, that since everyone else has said their age, I'm 45. So, being too young is a good problem to have. Okay, next question, we'll, we'll start with Dawn. Um, there is a direct connection between those who abuse and neglect animals and those who abuse and neglect people. And no animal should have to suffer at the hands of humans. And as a judge, would you make sure all animal abusers are sentenced to the fullest extent of the law? That's very difficult to say in just a vacuum because each case is different. Um, so I, I can't sit here and say that if defendant A is accused of animal neglect, he will be served so much time in jail, or B. It just depends upon the case, what he's done. The defendant's background and a whole host of circumstances. Uh, I will say this: uh, I'm very much an animal lover. Uh, I'm not a hunter. I don't hunt. I don't fish. Uh, and one of the reasons I don't hunt is because I love animals. I part of the pro one of the programs I started where we contribute. Uh, it's called the Alternative Community Service Program. I've raised two hundred fifty thousand dollars for charities, and probably. Thirty, forty thousand dollars of that have gone to the Lake County Animal Coalition. That's how much I love animals. And, uh, right now, we do prosecute uh, animal neglect and animal abuse to the fullest extent. And, we'll, and hopefully, when I leave the DA's office, they will continue to do that. As a judge, I can't tell you what the results are going to be, though. Thank you. Shonda? When I was at the DA's office, um, we got an update to the Judicial Council forms, and they're the forms that are used for restraining orders. And the new, the new restraining order for domestic violence at that point made me very happy because it included pets. Because a lot of people um, who are in abusive relationships are afraid to leave those relationships, not just for their children, but also for the cat, the dog, the turtle, or whatever it happens to be. And so I remember taking one of those restraining orders into a, a court and having to explain to the court that it was, you know, Murphy the orange tabby, that I was, that in addition to his, his pet person that we were getting restraining order. And initially I think it was met with some resistance, but I was very happy to see that because it's, it seems like a small thing, but it allows um, the courts to address 
what is a significant problem for some people coming in front of the courts or needing protection. So um, I can't tell you how I would rule in a particular case, but I do appreciate it that the, even the court forms have been updated to, um, to illustrate the importance that animals play both as a you know, sort of a gateway to people doing things to humans, but also that they are, their protection is important to many people. So the, the short answer would be, be yes, but I can't give you any particular fact situation. <laughs> Thank you. Andre. I'd have to distinguish myself a little bit from um, Mr. Anderson and his area as follows. I don't think the judicial canons allow a candidate for judge uh, to make a statement regarding possible leniency or possible harshness in sentencing in advance of actually hearing the facts that determine whether or not a person accused of a crime such as animal abuse or domestic violence or any of a host of other heinous crimes. Um, uh, I love animals as much as any other person. But as a judge, my primary job is to uphold the law and enforce the law, independent of public opinion, independent of my own beliefs, and in a way which is uh, in accordance with the law. Uh, if the facts are uh, adjudicated that a particular criminal defendant has committed a crime such as animal abuse or domestic violence or child abuse or any of a host of other heinous crimes, certainly, as a judge, I would see to it that the law is upheld that the appropriate sentence is imposed. That may be hard to do, given my own personal beliefs about animals or the beliefs of the audience in my courtroom. The job of a judge is to fairly and lawfully adjudicate the facts and apply the law to the best of his or her ability. And uh, um, there isn't much room for discretion when it comes to how a judge feels about the particular type of crime or the particular parties in his or her court. Thank you. Next question, we'll start with Shauna. This is a multi-part, so if any point you need me to repeat it, any of you don't, don't hesitate to ask. How many trials have you done in your career? What's the importance of a new judge having trial experience, and why? So I'm going to define the terms a little further before we go forward. I assume you're referring to jury trials? Just said trials. Trials, okay. So there are different kinds of trials. There's jury trials, there's court trials, there are administrative hearings and trials. If you're talking about jury trials between civil and criminal, I've done nine. If you're talking about um, court trials, I had, to, I had to figure this all out for the um, Judicial Nomination Evaluations, Co Evaluations Committee, and I've done over 100. If you're talking about administrative hearings, I have done, um, I've done about, I've done 27. So um, I want to be very clear on this because I've handled thousands of cases, but those are the, the jury trials. What I think is important is that you have a lot of courtroom experience. Not every every situation is a jury trial. There's appellate work. There's there's everything that goes into the daily daily um, into the daily running of a court that I think is very important. What I like is that. I like about me, I guess, is that I have, I've done a little bit of everything. I've done big litigation where you're, you know, the fourth chair and, and, you know, it's a big trial. I've done, you know, car accidents. I've done administrative hearings where people's jobs and careers are on the line and those are a casual setting, but they are much different. So, um, with that in mind, I think that it is important to have lots of courtroom experience and a um, variety of different types of trial experience defined in those different ways. Thank you. Andre. Uh, I, think my I think my colleague Ms. Harry did a very fun job answering that question. I think the question, how many of XYZ have you done, is a question that's uh, uh, not really a salient probative question. Um, I too have done many, many, many different things in my legal career. Uh, I have had the privilege of avoiding the expense and risk of a jury trial for my clients. That doesn't mean I haven't prepared for jury trials. That doesn't mean that, the, that I haven't done the work necessary to be able to do a jury trial. Uh, but when one works in Lake County for half of one's career, the opportunity to do jury trials is limited to cases involving insurance defense counsel or 
career prosecutors doing criminal matters or career defenders as a private lawyer with private clients who cannot afford the risk and expense of a jury trial. We work very hard to win our cases long before the trial date comes. Um, I've also done uh, a lot of different things in my career. I've practiced law uh, since 1995. Uh, I also practiced American law in Germany for two years, uh, working for a subsidiary of Warner Brothers and a German law firm. I've worked on building a transmission factory in Bari, Italy. I've worked on Warner Brothers movies in Germany. Uh, I've, I've, I've done hundreds of court appearances and I've never sat down and tried to guesstimate or speculate as to how many of X, Y, Z I've done. I don't think I uh, could give you an accurate answer and I don't think the answer has much meaning. What counts is, is the lawyer who's asking for your trust and faith to uphold the law able to do that job? There's not a law book in the Lake County Law Library, law library I can't read and understand in a relatively quick amount of time. Uh, I also have a master's degree in economics. I've studied uh, statistics and uh, econometrics. There's not an expert report. I can't read and understand in a reasonable amount of time. Um, I've worked with experts. Uh, I think the question, how many jury trials have you done, is a misleading question, and uh, I've done my best to explain why I feel I'm qualified. Thanks. Thank you. John? I must disagree with my opposition here. Jury trials and court trials are extremely important to the making of a judge. Uh, personally, I have done about 1,500 trials, mainly court trials, anywhere from uh, two-hour trials to, uh, you know, a four-month trial in particular, where it's a multi-defendant homicide case. Uh, I've done over approximately 50 jury trials themselves, mainly criminal, some civil uh, jury trials. One of the importances of doing these jury trials is when you're, when you're elected and you take office, it could be that same week you're, you're officiating over a, a jury trial and you have to know what to do. You have to know how to control the courtroom during a, a trial. You have to make instantaneous decisions on rules of evidence. If there's an objection, you've got to rule on that objection. And I don't care how much you read in a book, what the rules say, you have to have the experience to apply those rules to the fact situation and the question. If you don't have that, then you might not as well even have a trial or any rules of evidence. Because if you let wrong evidence in, either it's going to go up on appeal, or the person cannot afford an appeal, then the wrong decisions can easily be made. So yes, it's extremely important to have the experience behind you. I kind of question what I've heard here today about some experience of the other candidates versus what I've heard in other debates. They're not consistent. My, my experience is, is shown that it's always consistent, about 1,500 court trials and 50 jury trials. Thank you. Thank you. Next question sort of follows the, that similar, we'll start with Andre. Not all trials are jury trials. Many trials require discernment and the ability to know who is lying and who is telling the truth. What makes you know you have the ability to make decisions that are based on truthful discernments before you apply the law? Is it mine? Oh, sorry. I think that um, if I understand the question, uh, the question is what makes me think I can discern truth from falsehood? And uh, 25 years of successful practice, I think I've got a fully functional BS detector and have had no trouble at all discerning uh, truth from falsehood. Um, the only situation that potentially becomes very difficult is when we have, you have a court situation where you have all unrepresented parties who are uh, claiming certain things, stating certain things, alleging certain things, I think then some compassionate listening and some very well-posed questions in a civil, polite, and pointed way is usually all it takes to figure out who's uh, shoveling coal and who's shoveling something else. Thank you. Donald? 
Lying in court has always been a pet peeve of me. Uh, I'll tell you one of the things, that, things I've done, but in order to determine whether someone was lying, it's very difficult at times. It takes a lot of uh, experience, a lot of understanding of human nature uh, to try to get to determine whether or not they're lying or, or telling the truth. And sometimes you just can't tell. Uh, there are ways of uh, watching a person's body language, give you some hints, which may or may not give you a direction or a uh, indication whether they're telling the truth or a lie. Uh, one of the things you need to do is you need to listen to all the facts, all the witnesses. And sometimes if you have one person saying one thing and one person saying another, probability is that one person you really look at real close, uh, but not necessarily all the time. But I'm just going to say perjury, and that's what this is alluded to, has been a pet peeve of me. Uh, about three or four years ago, I started the country's first ever perjury intervention unit. And to this day, we've prosecuted and got convictions of approximately 10 individuals for lying in court. Uh, this is something I'm proud of. I, it's worked real well. I've gotten rid of write-ups, sorry, in the American Bar Journal, newspapers from the East Coast to Hawaii. Uh, the Wall Street Journal has written articles of this. And it's, to me, it's working very well. Uh, from my understanding, talking with some judges, other attorneys, they have noticed a difference. And in this perjury unit, what I do, I have an attorney and an investigator. And I will go into the, uh, the mediation sessions, like family law mediation. And my investigator and attorney will give a lecture to the people involved in custody cases, uh, what we're doing and the consequences if they do lie. Um, and as a, if a judge, if I can elect a judge, I will try to continue that and refer cases to the DA's office. Thank you. Shonda? So I think the most important thing about knowing how to discern whether people are telling the truth or lying is listening to them. It's, I've always said that if you let people talk long enough, they will reveal themselves. They will tell you what they really want to say. They will tell you the point they really want to get to. And they will, um, if they're lying, they'll betray themselves by, you know, making assertions that aren't practically possible or several other things like that. But I think that you have to listen to people. You also have to ask clarifying questions if they're um, using terms in a particular way or you know, talking about apples when you're actually asking them about turnips. So you have to really just listen. And I think that is probably true in all situations, but especially for a judge because so much of what we do in a courtroom every day is, is done with a certain formality or pomp and circumstance, whatever you want to call it, but people will tell you what's really going on and they'll tell you what's really happening or they'll reveal themselves to be lying if you just listen closely enough. And so that is something I try very hard to do. Thank you. Next question, we'll start with Dawn. Um, over the last several years, there's been criticism of the Lake County Grand Jury, which has uh, been seen by some as issuing uninformed decisions based more on personal bias than on facts. What's your opinion of the Grand Jury, and when it's your turn to be presiding judge, how would you handle any concerns about it? First of all, there's two different types of Grand Jury. There's a civil Grand Jury and the criminal Grand Jury. I should clarify, this is about the civil Grand Jury. Civil Grand Jury, okay. Uh, <clears throat> The Superior Court judge, or actually the presiding judge, is in charge of the grand jury and oversees uh, all grand jury proceedings. If there's issues in a proceeding, the uh, grand jury can come to either county council, the district, or the district attorney for advice. But eventually, it goes up to the judge to make a determination. Um, I have never, uh, every year, the grand jury comes out with their reports, and I read, read from cover to cover. I have never really noticed the, any bias or any personal issues that the grand jury has brought before the, the court in their reports. Um, not always do I agree with what they have to say, especially if it involves the DA's office. They're, they've been critical of my office on some issues, on some of my programs, but you know, uh, I respect their opinion. Thank you. Shonda? I think the 
civil grand jury is there to have a, a independent body oversee things. And of course, everybody who comes into a system, even if they don't have their biases, they're going to have things that they want to focus on. They get on a grand jury because they're concerned about streets, or they get on a grand jury because they're concerned about, I don't know, marijuana or whatever. I think the grand jury, um, in my experience with them, because they do come through the county council's office, they are, they try very hard to do the best job they can. They're essentially volunteering their time, and they are bringing to light things that sometimes are relevant, sometimes are not, but I think that I have not seen any personal biases in the grand jury that have been concerning. The grand juries have limited limited power. Their job is to, to make suggestions and, and concerns, and then it requires the county or the department to answer them. And, and that is where their power lies in making sure that those departments at least make some sort of an answer. They may not may not agree with it or it may not solve the problem, but that is, I'm sorry about that, and that is um, where their power lies. So I haven't actually seen any biases, and so um, I, I don't feel it's a concern. Thank you. Andre? With respect to, um with respect to the civil grand jury in Lake County, uh, I'm not particularly critical of the materials that I've read from that group, and I think that Lake County voters, Lake County citizens, Lake County residents, any opportunity we have to bring people in to exercise oversight over local government, I think is a good thing. I think if there were indelicacies or critic, crit critiques that were uh, deemed too harsh or maybe potentially misdirected, I think the appropriate response is to uh, is to excuse whatever transgressions there might be and look at the substance of the complaints that our grand juries have identified. Where those complaints are legitimate, they need to be responded to and public officials need to be put, put to the test of responding to the grand jury's complaints. Um, I'm, I, I'm less inclined to be critical of the civil grand jury and more inclined to promote that, that entity's work for the benefit of Lake County and uh, Lake County's citizens. And I'll leave it up to the uh, lawyers in the county council's office to deal with those criticisms in a professional, responsible way, which I believe the county has uh, uh, tried to do in most instances. Thank you. Next question, we'll start with Shonda. Uh, the caseload in the Lake County Superior Court is split approximately 50-50 between criminal and civil. I'm correct that if it's wrong, by the way. Um, please describe the percentage of your experience in criminal and civil work. How recent is that experience? And I believe that is about correct. I mean, it's, it may not be exactly 50%, but what I will always say is that it's the criminal cases that make the headlines, but you know, you've got people in there dealing with divorces, contracts, guardianships, all the type of things that make up people's day-to-day -day life, and that is a good portion of what takes up the court system. Um, as I noted in my opening, I spent um, four years as a deputy district attorney. I also, um, I wrote my master's thesis on criminal jurisdiction in Indian country, so I have heard of a specialty in that. So that has been my criminal experience. Also in the um, county council's office, we deal with um, things that might be called quasi-civil criminal issues and things that arise out of criminal issues. I, I represent the jail a lot, so that is that all comes down to criminal issues. Civil, um, I worked at the county council's office for six years. I was also a litigation associate at a large law firm where we did business litigation and environmental litigation. And I also was an attorney for um, Robinson Rancheria as their general counsel, where we did everything, environmental, business litigation, and I was an ICWA attorney, which is the Indian Child Welfare Act attorney. So, um, and I've done appellate work as well on, a, on several civil cases. Um, so I have pretty much done, if there is a type of law out there, I have some experience with it. I've taken several cases to the appeals courts, and we, we have kind of this joke in the county's, county council's office where, you know, I'll be sitting there writing an appellate brief on some grand constitutional issue, and the, that afternoon I'll get a call about what to do with a dead animal in a creek that's draining in farmland. So we deal with everything. And um, 
So I've had a lot of experience in a lot of different things. Thank you. Andre. This particular question is easy for me to answer. Since January 2007, I've worked with Mike Ewing. We do not do criminal cases. I have not practiced criminal law uh, while working with Ewing and Associates. Um, uh, my practice has been 95% civil over the last 20 plus years. That doesn't mean that I can't bring a fresh perspective to the bench when confronted with a criminal case. I'm not a jaded defender who views uh, all cops as dishonest, and I'm not a jaded prosecutor who views all suspects as guilty. Uh, I would bring a fresh perspective, competent perspective, a perspective with integrity and honesty to the bench, uh, and that will serve me well, uh, whether it's a civil case I happen to be hearing or a criminal case. I will have to work a bit to get back on the, uh, up to speed on criminal law, but that's not an impossible or even daunting prospect. Thank you. Don. I understand the question is like, what percentage of experience in my career I have in each of the fields? And um, Elizabeth framed it as a 50-50. There's actually three areas uh, of law, and as I put it anyway, one is civil, there's criminal, and the third is family law. You can't really put family law as part of civil. Uh, in the civil arena, that's probably been about 10% of my caseload over the last 28 years as a, an attorney. Uh, I've done the real estate contracts, uh, personal injury, practice in federal courts, court of appeals, and, uh, and state appellate courts. Family law, that's probably been about another 40% of my, my experience. Uh, that was during my first 20, or, yeah, first 20 years as an attorney. Criminal law, I would have to put that like maybe 50%. And of that 50%, uh, probably 10% of that was defending people accused of crimes. And obviously, over the last eight years, I'm prosecuting crimes, uh, all, all different kinds of crimes, from anything from almost like spitting on the sidewalk to multiple homicides. I oversee all the, all homicides have to go, well, actually right now, all felonies, settlements have to go through myself. I don't delegate that to any person. And lastly, I kind of take a little bit of offense where Andre said, if I understood him right, that, uh, how would he put it, uh, oh, we'll plan that everybody's guilty. We don't do that. We, when we look at a case, we don't try to determine whether they're guilty. We try to determine what the facts are. And if they're innocent, we will release them right away. Uh, our job is not to put people in prison. Our job is to see that justice is done. I, there's been three cases in particular where I've had people released from in custody has been there for some one 18 years, others for about six months. When we found out for different reasons that they were actually innocent, we got them right out of jail. And that's the way we will, I will always be. Thank you. If any of you uh, still want to submit some questions, we've got a few left. Jeff, there's one right here in the front. We'll try to get those answered. We're moving along pretty rapidly. So we have a few left. Still take a couple if you want to ask. Okay. Next question, and we'll start with Andre. Describe how often you will have to recuse yourself from hearing cases that come before the Superior Court because you have prior involvement in them and how that will impact the already understaffed court's workload? That's a very good question. Uh, and I think of the three candidates here before you, I am the least burdened by a long book of ethical restrictions or conflicts of interest. Um, Mr. Anderson makes a long shrift of his honor uh, as being a prosecutor of the year in his ballot statement. What he's not telling you is that he's not going to be able to hear criminal cases for a period of time when, if and when he gets elected judge. Um, I don't have but a, a list or a roster of private uh, clients that I can have a conflict with. There's no reason for me to, do, to uh, recuse myself unless a client or a former client or perhaps my employer shows up in my courtroom. That's not the case for Mr. Anderson due to his eight years of service as your district attorney. And there's also, uh, I think, a good likelihood that Ms. Harry will have a certain number of matters that she will have to recuse herself from from her time as uh, serving you as a county counsel. 
I don't have those uh, barriers. I can be as the most flexible of the three judicial candidates up here uh, at the DS. Thank you. Don. Uh, I'm going to address this without giving to family and friends. That could be a conflict on occasions. But uh, what Andre says is true. I will not be able to handle criminal cases. Normal time is about two years. I would, I would be more likely assigned to family law, civil litigation, and things such as that. However, uh, you can't do settlements. Settlement conferences are a big part of the criminal, uh, the makeup, to try to settle the case before it goes to trial. And because I've been a DA, I think I can have a different outlook on, on settling cases, not only from the prosecution side, but as I just said, I've defended several clients also. Now, even, but however, even in settlement cases, if it's a, a case that the complaint has my name on it, then I got to stay way away from it. But with the turnover in cases, that will probably end within six months. So I'll be able to handle settlements and, and, and also, also be able to do jury trials as long as I'm not the one to sign the complaint. Thank you. Thank you. Shonda. So there are very few cases that I would have to recuse myself from. Um, obviously, for the first couple of years, any case where the County of Lake is the, um, I guess, the plaintiff or the defendant in a case, but that is a handful at most. So um, I. Um, Andre here is right. I have a few more than him, but far less than, than Mr. Anderson. I did sort of a quick analysis, and if I were to sit on the bench starting in January, there's a few cases, about 10 cases I would like to close before then, and probably about five cases going forward from there I could not adjudicate. And um, that would be very obvious from the, the case and what position it is in based on my former job. So I don't think with me it'd be much of a, uh, a consideration, but you know, with any judge there's going to be a few cases. There's going to be his you know, wife's cousin who's getting a divorce or, or something. So I think the ones I can identify would probably be under 10 at this point. Thank you. Next question, and we'll start with Dawn. What experience do you have with juveniles? Your answer will be important to me since I serve on the Juvenile Justice Commission. What does restorative justice mean to you in relation to juveniles in particular? Okay, I, I have done several juvenile cases uh, through my career, especially in the first 20 years and uh, doing anything from what they call 300 cases, which is juvenile dependency, when, in essence, the children are either taken away from the, the parents or gone through some type of uh, reunification program. Uh, I've also done uh, juvenile work uh, defending little juvenile criminal defendants. And we have a juvenile division within the DA's office that I oversee for all juvenile crimes. Uh, restorative justice program is basically to, to try and do is restore your victims to as much as being whole as possible. Very difficult with juveniles because there's only there's a limit of what you can do with juveniles and, and getting restitution out of a juvenile and it's going to be carried onto them maybe for the rest of their life. Uh, sometimes warranted, sometimes not. And uh, yeah, I strongly believe on the restorative justice. It's uh, it's a great conception. In reality, um, you don't get there usually. Usually, people that will commit crimes, some crimes just don't have the means and never will have the means to make their victims whole. But at least in the DA's office, we try our best to, to get to that goal. Thank you, Shonda. I believe very strongly in restorative justice. I think that restorative justice is, is far more complex than Mr. Anderson has just said it was. Restorative justice has to do with restoring not only a victim, but making sure that the, in this case, the perpetrator, or in a general sense, that society is restored. And that means 
also looking at restorative justice as it applies to the, the perpetrator of a crime, especially when they're juveniles. The, the, I'm generally not speaking about people who commit um, you know, murders or, or serious you know, felonies, but most of the things that come to the court are property crimes or low-level drug crimes or, or that type of thing. And so restorative justice makes society whole. It makes sure that the person who is, um, who's perpetrated the, the crime comes out of the system a better person because they're going to have to go back out into society. And it does also make sure that the person who was the victim of the crime is made whole. Um, I believe in restitution, I believe in alternative sentencing, and I believe in restorative justice because we live in a world where our jails are crowded and they are not um, always able to provide services and we have to create a world where the people come out of jail or out of the situation able to be productive members of society. So that's my understanding of what restorative justice means. I don't believe in necessarily being lenient on people. I think that you know, things that are restorative justice require people to work very hard to earn that, to earn that um, restoration of their place in society. And so I think that that's an important thing to focus on. Thank you. Andre. I certainly don't have much to contribute uh, to our discussion regarding juvenile delinquency cases. The last time I made a court appearance in a delinquency matter was 1996, I believe. Nevertheless, uh, Ms. Harry was right. We have a finite number of judges, a finite number of courtrooms, and by the way, you're all paying for all of this wheel spinning in our uh, juvenile justice system. Anything we can do as a court together, as a group of judges, to steer uh, young people away from the criminal justice system and in other directions is worth devoting time, energy, and attention to. Uh, restorative justice is a way of bringing parties together, uh, people who have been hurt by bad acts, people who have committed bad acts, to try to make a, a positive outcome out of a negative situation. Uh, any practical judge confronted with the, a large workload and a finite number of hours to work is gonna wanna see that uh, his or her courtroom not be filled with cases that can be resolved through either ADR or restorative justice or some other program. Uh, keeping folks, kids, young people who have drug problems or mental health issues out of the criminal justice system should be a top priority. And, and, and in doing so, judicial resources can be directed at the harder cases where punishment uh, is warranted and called for. Thank you. Next question. Um, since so the perjury units come up, and we have a question about this specifically, and it's specifically asked of, of Dawn, but I'm going to ask it slightly different so that both of you can answer it as well. So bear with me as I go through this. Um, so uh, we'll actually start with Shonda. <laughs> so I'm going to ask this of you this way, and same with Andre, and then I'll ask. I'll reword it for Dawn. Do you think there was a need for a special law? or a special perjury unit, but when perjury is already a crime. And does it make sense to put a person who lied in something like a divorce proceeding in state prison for four years? I think that since perjury is already a crime and can be punished um, independent of a perjury unit, it was probably not necessary in the DA's office. In the land of finite resources, you have to decide where to put them, and perjury, though very important, can be um, adjudicated within the normal course of, of cases. They can be tried in those kind of situations. Um, I think perjury is a serious problem, but most importantly, I think the most serious parts of perjury is when people actually achieve their goal by committing an act of perjury. Um, everybody understands when you're sitting on the bench that someone may come in front of you and lie. It's when those situations have led to a particular decision or led to something happening that probably shouldn't. So I, I can't say, I mean, I'm not running for DA, so um, me commenting on a DA program is a, little, is a little odd, but I think that there are other ways to um, spend finite resources. Thank you. Andre? This is a very good question. It's a very important question because Mr. Anderson is, is attempting to convince you all that on his own, only in Lake County, 
He is the founder of some novel invention called his Perjury Investigation Unit, which has somehow uh, served Lake County better than anyone else ever has. I have news for everyone. Every licensed lawyer who knows what his or her ethical responsibilities are, keeps up with those responsibilities, and practices law in an ethical matter is a perjury intervention unit. Every single lawyer has an ethical obligation to prevent perjured testimony from getting into court. Calling, uh, assigning the staff and resources of a district attorney and a district attorney investigator uh, to chase folks who aren't able to correctly fill out court forms and to prosecute those people is a massive investment of energy and time and resources in something that could be dealt with simply through competent lawyering, simply through competent judging. Perjured testimony should be disregarded, and uh, 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 I view I the perjury investigation unit as, as a political boondoggle. <clears throat> Mr. Anderson is a very capable attorney. Mr. Anderson is an extremely capable politi political attorney. And he's telling you in his ballot statement, among other things, that he's created this new thing that's never been done before. When in fact, for, for as long as there have been lawyers, perjury has been something uh, to be prosecuted and to be avoided. Uh, I'll have more to say to, that, uh, to this thing, in, uh, to the perjury investigation unit in my closing statement. We'll have 20 seconds if you want to touch. You still have like 20 seconds if you want to. I'll finish. Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay, so Don, let me ask the question slightly different for you since it was addressed to you. Why did you think there was a need for a special <coughs> unit when perjury is already a crime? And does it make sense to put a woman who lied in a divorce proceeding in state prison for four years? Okay. First of all, what I, I can't believe I heard what I just heard, that Perjury is not a serious issue. Perjury is an affront to the criminal justice system. Every person that gets on the stand and tells the truth, that's an affront. And that's something I, I would not stand for. It's, I don't know what he's going to say in his closing, but I'm taking from an uh, article written by the president of the National District Attorneys Association that said this is the first ever perjury intervention unit and several other newspaper articles, and if you want to know it, I'll show you those articles later. Um, why I started the perjury unit? First, perjury was never prosecuted in Lake County and seldom prosecuted in the state of California. And I, I say never, I think there was one perjury case many, many, many years ago. And I don't even know what the facts of that were. Perjury, as I alluded to the case of Luther Jones, why is perjury important? Because Luther Jones spent 18 years in prison as a child molester when it was based on perjured testimony of the, the mother of his daughter and his 10-year-old uh, stepdaughter. If that is not important, then my God, there's nothing in the system that is important. In custody cases, there was a custody case, it was in San Jose that came out, that uh, the father perjured himself in a, a custody battle. Uh, the mother was accusing him of abusing the child. He convinced the judge through perjured testimony that he did not abuse the judge. And he got custody of that child. A week later, he killed the child. Yeah, perjury is important to me. As yeah, so it should be important to every person in this county and every judge that sits on the bench. Perjury is important. Thank you. You're winding down. If anybody has any final questions, I've just got a couple more I'm going to ask. And here's a really quick one for you. Starting with Andre. How long have you been in Lake County? Since January of 2007. Why'd you come here? My father had a massive heart attack, moved up here and retired. I did caretaking uh, for the year for 2006 and decided that I had found Minnesota without snow. Did you find any good beep bop or rhubarb pie or anything like Nothing that? Nothing takes the taste of humiliation out of your mouth better than beep bop or rhubarb pie. Didn't miss a beep. Well done. Um, Dawn. Okay. I've been in Lake County. I've been in Lake County since my junior year in high school. That was in 1969. So far back, I can't tell you what month I was here. Um, just, it was short. It was like, how long have you been here? Why'd you come here? 
Oh, I came here because uh, my parents moved here. We couldn't find work in San Jose and Santa Rosa, where, where we were from. So I followed them and pretty much stayed here ever since. So as I said in my opening statement, my family's been here since the 1960s and 1970s. I first swam in Clear Lake when I was about three months old. There are some pictures there. And I always joke that when people say they can't swim in the lake, I always say, well, I've been doing it since, I, since 1973. And I've, I've lived to tell the tale. But I moved here permanently about 15 years ago. Um, my parents decided to retire up here. My, um, my grandmother uh, moved up here, as did my aunt and uncle. And so I moved up here to, I ended up getting a job at Robinson Rancheria where I could use my specialty in Indian law. And I decided to stay. I've, I had always loved it up here. You know, you sort of have that, um, when you sort of think of that like mythical place you call home, I always imagined, you know, sitting on the lake looking at Mount Kanakdai. And so about 15 years ago, I decided to make it my home and, and have set down roots with family and children. Thank you. Okay, the final question we're going to ask is, is um, you may have touched upon this previously, but you can expand a little bit uh, more on it now. We'll start with Dawn. It's a two-part question. What sets you apart from your opponents, and how do you outshine the other candidates? Definitely not the looks. Um, what sets me apart from my opponents, I think, is experience. There's, there's three different types of experience. There's legal experience, there's uh, courtroom experience, and there's life experience. The legal experience, uh, like I said, I've been in the criminal justice system for 43 years now, from deputy sheriff to uh, private attorney to uh, now the district attorney. I volunteered as a judicial arbitrator, I think it's 12 years, six years as a judge pro tem, and also acted as an administrative law judge for the city of Lakeford. Uh, courtroom experience said I've done 1,500 more cases from in minor cases up to multiple defendant murder cases. Uh, life experience, uh, I said earlier, I've been a deputy sheriff for 15 years. Love the job, a lot of life experiences, a lot of meeting people, a lot of seeing the worst of society and some of the best of society. Um, and you, it's extremely important that a judge has all these experiences in order for him to make his decisions he needs to make and the understanding of the people before him. And that's the main thing that I, uh, I think I bring to the bench more so than my clients, or sorry, my opposition. Sorry, no, you won't. That's true. Um, and what makes me shine? Um, you know, probably my work ethic, my integrity, and what I believe in. You know, I believe in the system. Thank you. John. So I think what sets me apart from my opponents in this is the broad nature of my experience. I've been both a criminal attorney, a civil attorney, I've worked for tribes, and that is an important thing in this county where you end up, we have seven, seven um, tribes in this area, and those kind of issues come up. So I have, I also think I'm set apart by the fact that I've always wanted to be a judge. This is what I have worked for. I've tried to get very type of experience and to make sure that I kept my practice in such a way that I could always present to you that I had been respectful to the courts and that I had taken everything that I was doing incredibly seriously. Um, how do I shine? Um, I guess I think that, or what would I add to the court, I think is one thing that I would like to say. I think that um, the one thing that makes me different from my opponents is I would add diversity to the court. And I think we are at a point of needing that. I think that I can bring something and a different something, a different perspective to the court. And I, in addition to having all this broad-based experience, I offer that different expect, perspective. And so, um, so I, I think I'll end there. That is where my, that is the end of that question. <laughs> Thank you, Andre. I think all three of us have 
very broad, interesting lives. What I think sets me apart is I think I have the best understanding of what the job at hand is. I'm the only candidate that mentions the Constitution in his ballot statement. I'm not selling you a false or misleading bag of goods. I've got a, a resume, as does Ms. Harry and Mr. Anderson, that speaks for itself. I've got 11 years of practice in your community, and I'm, I'm simply a little fish from a much bigger pond that really likes Lake County. I'm not a big fish in this small pond. I want to see Lake County succeed. I want to see Lake County function better. I want to see Lake County move in the direction of success. I want people to want to come to Lake County and feel they have a good shot at building here, succeeding here, having families here. And when they get into a dispute with a neighbor, or they get pulled over by the side of the road, or heaven forbid they get sued, that they're going to be able to go into a courtroom in Lake County and expect the same level of justice and service that every other courtroom in, St. In, in the state of California offers to people. You're entitled to that. The voters are entitled to that. Uh, and I think that uh, come election day, if you take a look at our ballot statements, talk to your friends, you'll make a choice and you'll elect a judge who's committed to upholding the law and doing it in an independent and fearless way. That's what you're entitled to. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna, that is the end of the questions. We're going to move into closing statements now. Um, you've covered a lot of territory tonight, so we want to give you the opportunity just to sum up. And you can speak about whatever you'd like to. You, have, you each are gonna get two minutes to just emphasize, underline what's important from tonight's event. And we're going to go in reverse alphabetical order. So each, again, each of you will get two minutes and we will start with Andre. California has had a problem. Between the year 2006 and 2016, approximately 41 deputy district attorneys ran for a judgeship in L.A. County. And of those 41 deputy district attorneys, only one of them described themselves as a deputy district attorney. The other 40 chose their own version of hardcore drug prosecutor, rape prosecutor, murder prosecutor. And this problem resulted in so much chaos and the misleading of the voters the California legislature last year passed a, a, an amendment to California Elections Code 13107 barring prosecutors from describing themselves in their ballot statements as anything other than either an attorney at law or a, de a district attorney or a deputy district attorney. That law came into effect January 1st, 2018 this year. Mr. Anderson's ballot statement takes great pains to describe him as a prosecutor of the year, as a, a person responsible for three criminal exonerations, as the founder of Lake County's uh, perjury investigation unit. And the level of dishonesty there is something that should be examined. And that should be examined with respect to all of the candidates who are running for this very important public office. The office in which you place your trust that the law will be upheld in a competent, ethical, and efficient manner, and that the person who you place this trust uh, in will do so independent of public opinion and independent of their own personal uh, beliefs or biases. I urge you strongly to take a good look at the ballot statements that all three candidates have prepared. I, 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 I urge you strongly to consider whether it makes sense to prosecute uh, folks who are unable to uh, accurately fill out court forms over uh, the other uh, crimes and misdeeds that uh, we have here in Lake County today. In 2017, when uh, Mr. Anderson uh, was prosecuting uh, perjurers in Lake County, uh, a significant amount of resources were consumed with very little measurable success in changing anything. Is that my stop sign? That's it, I'm oh, sorry. I'll continue this at the next event. <laughs> <laughs> or stay after and we'll make him stay here and answer some more questions. Thank you. Okay, Shonda. So I think I said before that judicial candidates don't make promises. We don't make political promises because we're not allowed to by the judicial candidates. So I always feel a bit that people come away from these kind of events feeling like they may not have gotten things what they were looking for because they, they didn't get a stance on this or a stance on that. 
So what I always like to say is that you, I will make everyone in Lake County the promise that when they come into my courtroom, they will be treated with respect and dignity and justice will be served no matter whether you're, you know, no matter your status in life, no matter your station in life, and that I make a promise to make sure everybody isn't necessarily happy with the results, but feel like the system has listened to them and that it has worked for them, not necessarily getting what they want, but they've been had their day in court. And I, that is the promise that I make to people. I have wanted to be a judge for a long time, and I have spent a lot of time thinking about what it means to be a judge. And I want to offer you my promise that I will always approach the job with integrity, with a work, a work ethic that I think everybody can be proud of, and that I will never forget the importance of the, of the role I am playing. And the judge is the most important person in the courtroom, not because they sit on a high bench or they are called your honor, but because everything is their responsibility and that they set the tone. And I, I make that promise that I will never forget that and I will work hard for this county. Thank you. Oh. Uh, there's an attorney in town I admire very much. His name is Ron Green. And he uh, had a conversation today. He said, a lot of this election may depend upon what I have done as a district attorney. If I accomplish my goals, I stand a good chance of being elected. If I fall in flat, then I don't stand a chance. Uh, when I first took over, if people can remember the old Dinius case, the DA's office had a lot of problems. In the past eight years, those problems have been corrected. We've done a lot of things. We've got a great reputation, not only within the county, but throughout the state. Uh, we've increased our conviction rate 21% on our jury trials. Uh, have committed programs towards human trafficking, which we're fighting now. Uh, a perjury unit. Uh, a creative program, the Alternative Community Service Program, where we've raised over $250,000 for local charities that came from uh, people who have been convicted of crimes. Uh, instead of doing community service outside of Lake County, they can contribute to a charity. Put a lot of meals on the table for hungry people, uh, done a lot of different things, bought shoes for kids and different programs. This is a program I'm extremely proud of. Uh, a lot of people say I'm too tough on crime. Uh, maybe so. Uh, but that's my job as a district attorney. But. I've also been one who I've rather free an innocent person than ever see a, a guilty person go to jail. And that's what I've proven on some of the things I've done. And I, because of that stance and the way I stance, I was awarded the Prosecutor of the Year last year by the California Narcotic Officers Association, which is something I'm extremely proud of. And lastly, about dishonesty, Andre, it's easy to say, very easy to say I'm dishonest, but show me where. I, I challenge you to show me where. And by you saying that I perjured people for filling out forms wrong, that is dishonesty. It's never happened and never will happen. People go to jail for perjury, for lying in court, without mistakes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That ends our, our forum. Thank you very much to all three of our candidates, Don Anderson, Shonda Harry, and Andre Ross for participating in tonight's event. You covered a lot of territory. Thank you to our audience for being here and for all the questions you brought to us. We really appreciate that. Um, thank you to our co-sponsors, Lake County Bar Association and the Lake County Economic Development Corporation, um, who partnered with Lake County News for tonight's event. We have two more forums this campaign season before the, the June primary. We have one for the District 3 Supervisorial Race on May 9th, and one for the District Attorney on May 14th. Both will be in the board chambers at the Lake County Courthouse in Lakeport. We also have online the Lake County Office of it, or the Lake County Superintendent of Schools in the District 2 races, which have been done previously. This uh, event has also been videotaped and will be available online. Um, and I just want to thank you again for being here. Good luck to all of you. Thanks to all of you for being here. And um, have a great night. Thank you.